Hi everybody, this is Poonam Sagar at IndoIndians.com and today we have with us Julia Surya Kusuma. And you would all have read about uh, Julia's columns in the Jakarta Post that come every week. And just yesterday there was this amazing column by Julia in the newspapers. <laughs> Julia is an Indo-Indian. She was born in India, in New Delhi to be precise. And she is here. She is uh, a child of a diplomat and because of all her cross-country, different countries experience, she has, her mind has been enriched and she is now, according to her confession, a feminist and an activist. <laughs> she is a writer and she became, uh, began writing in 1971. She has also published many brilliant books uh, such as State Eboism, The Social Construction of Womanhood in New Order Indonesia, Sex, Power and Nation, Julia's Jihad, and various other articles. So, welcome Julia. Thank you. Happy to be here. So Julia, I see that you're wearing a salwar kameez. I am, indeed. And uh, there is a marked affinity towards India. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, you already said that I was born there, so I think that's... Um, there's definitely a spiritual connection to India and the reason I'm wearing this shalwar kameez, which is white, is because uh, I will be attending a talk by Didi Nirmala, who is uh, from the Brahma Kumaris. And uh, they are a spiritual organization based in India, which is mainly headed by women, which is quite a, maybe a rarity in India. And I have been a fellow traveler of the Brahma Kumaris since 1981. So that's one uh, connection is spiritual. Uh, the other is, of course, as an Indonesian, culturally, culturally, the, I keep on saying in my, I have often said in my columns that India is our mother culture. So, you know, there's so many things. Even my name, Surya Kusuma, is, is Sanskrit. Although in India they say, uh, they pronounce it differently. Um, and then Indiati is my middle name, so I carry India wherever I go, at least in my passport, <laughs> not in my Katepe, it's too, because it's too long. And um, so that culturally, yeah, that, that, and, then, and then also for me, politically, I always look at India as, um, I always uh, I write in my columns, uh, I always say to my readers, to Indonesians, look at India, look at mm -hmm. India, look up to India. You know, even though India has a, a whole lot of problems which are which are just as bad as Indonesia. But of course I look at the positive things and I have frequently written articles about that, you know. Uh, and uh, recently in February I went to India for an India-Indonesia seminar and it had been Ten years uh, since I was last there, so right. yeah, and it was in New Delhi, so it was it really felt like a homecoming, you know, and and of course because it was an India Indonesia seminar, there were lots of people who also are uh, keen on forging Indonesia India relations, and uh, so I'm thinking, well, this is one of my next projects is to try to to forge closer links to. Indonesia in between Indonesia and India because it seems like an obvious thing to do except for the geography <laughs> you know and uh, despite uh, Bollywood which is very popular in Indonesia it's a, ch a challenge uh, you know because I think Indonesians prefer to look to the West and, you know yeah I think that's a common disease for all the Asian countries we yes tend to look but to tell us more about activism, what motivated you to become an activist? Because, uh, because I was, uh, I think I was born angry. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was born a rebel. You know, first of all, I, I, I was uh, only seven months when I was born because my, I was actually conceived in Penang. Mm. So I was traveling even when I was in my mother's womb. And uh, my um, mother, my parents moved to Delhi. Were post my father was posted in Delhi uh, when my mother was 
like six, six and a half months pregnant and all that moving around made her tired so she gave birth to me well prematurely but and I was underweight and all that but well, I'm one meter 72 now so <laughs> so I didn't do too badly even though I was really fussy as a, as a baby I'm still fussy now huh. I think but in a good way and um, <clears throat> um, I think there were many things uh, well the main thing I think was that uh, patriarchy was in my life in my family even before I was born and certainly after I was born I felt it and uh, certainly when my brother was born uh, six, uh, six years after me although actually I had an older brother and a younger brother and a younger sister but they all died Oh no. Yes, that's right. Yeah, and, and then and so, which is uh, pretty pretty sad. They come to my mother in her dreams. Uh, uh, but anyway, um, yeah. So coming so, back to the activism. Yes. So th that's the activism. Yeah. So I think uh, I was always bothered by things that were not right. Mm. I always wanted, even when I was a child, my mother used to say, "You want to change the world." And and I was I kind of I didn't know exactly what that meant at the time, but I think it's I think that's true. That's true. I still want to change the world up to now. You know, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm I will be sixty four in July, <laughs> and I still want to change the world. And um, I think uh, the discrimination in my family uh, produced a lot of anger in, in me. And then oh, the other thing was also being a diplomat child uh, being different wherever I went whether it's uh, whether I was a, certainly when I was abroad but also when I was back in my own country because I was seen uh, as different yes different and almost foreign you know mm -hmm. people ask me where do you come from mm -hmm. and um, and then and and then uh, oh actually okay I was an activist when I was in elementary school uh, about at the age of 11 or something and one of the uh, Teachers, our class teacher didn't used to come, and I, I incited the other students <laughs> to draw up a petition, to draw a petition and deliver it to the headmaster. And um, initially, they 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 agreed with me. Uh, yeah, we, you know, we, we should do this. And but then when on the day, they they said, oh, our parents won't allow us to do this. So. Oh really? I said, okay, I'll go on my own. So I, I trudged to the headmaster's office with this petition in my hand. And I said, okay, here's my petition. You know, and of course the headmaster was very angry at me. And I felt so ashamed uh, because it turned out that the teacher had was teaching in other places because he didn't have, earn enough money. Oh, you know, so I felt... So kind of born sad. activist. Yes, I think I, I was, you know, so I, I, it's, I, that's the beginning and, and it... Um, it continued. It just it just continued until Today. now, I guess. Yeah. Who has been your greatest inspiration and why? Well, I don't really have one uh, person who I think I don't I don't really have I kind of there's many people who inspire me. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm inspired by people all the time. I I think and that's one of the things that I like about myself because I always see wonder you know in everything is I, uh, I see um, I, I just I haven't lost that childlike naivety you know I think that a blade of grass is, is a miracle and there's so many things there's if your eyes can if you if you adjust your eyes there's so many miracles in life and so there are many there are many um, the uh, people and things that inspire me. Right. I, I can't really point to one one single, one single thing, you know. But uh, for example, people who who really stretch themselves, you know, people like people who are, have disabilities and they can uh, they can Overcome. do yeah they can do things that that able-bodied people can't. One you two. know, those yeah. are really inspiring. Oh, my latest inspiration. I never thought that I would say this. Is excuse me, I can't. Don't know if I can say this. Is Mahathir Muhammad? <laughs> <laughs> well, he is inspiring. Well, ninety-two. Exactly, exactly. You know, I mean, these are. I guess 
right now when it comes to age it's I look at people much older than me like Didi and I have a former lecturer of mine uh, Ibu Saparina Sadli who is over 90 and she still walks very uh, erect you know she's uh, and she still has her this very um, hearty laugh and uh, I don't know she thinks I'm very funny when she calls me on the phone the first thing that she does is ha 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 you know I say what am I uh, a clown or something you know but anyway yeah the, I think old people are my inspiration for now because I'm in my I'm just I've just start, entered my third third act mm -hmm. what Jane Fonda calls the third act have you heard of it Okay, so the, the life is, she says, it's made of three phases. The first 30 years, the second 30, and then, and, then thir and then the third, the third part is uh, called the third act is 60 onwards. And she sees life as like a staircase, not like, uh, like you go up and then you go down, you become old and decrepit. You continue develop, developing because, you know, uh, you can... I believe in lifelong learning. I believe that that you know um, it. Um, what is it? Pablo Picasso said, uh, "Youth has no age." Yeah. So I will. I'm forever. I'm ageless. I'm forever youthful, even when I'm a hundred. Wow. A lot of your beliefs uh, have created or generated negativity. A lot of your beliefs, your books. There, there, there has been a lot of reaction. Some of them has been great. Some of them has been. How do you manage? How do you take care of any negativity? Negativity. Yeah. Oh well, uh, I I've always been even before I realized it myself. I've always I've been accused of being very positive. <laughs> I think it's probably just a given, you know. But one of the things I really love about getting older is that is that you can you do away with all that stuff, you know, all the unnecessary uh, hang-ups that were just so burdensome when you're young but when you're older you think oh, why did that bother me you know so you're and so free now, yeah no I, absolutely you know I, I just uh, well the Brahma Kumaris um, mm -hmm. has teachings you know they have the meditation which is like the fuel mm -hmm. it gives you the energy and the teachings which give you the direction um, that's what the Brahma Kumaris has done for me and it really really it is it helps me to uh, deal with this negativity and for example if they, they say just give blessings so that's what I do when people are negative to me uh, um, people are nasty or mean to me I don't curse them I bless them mm -hmm. you know yeah so it's become a habit you know I think it started when I was 40 and it was wasn't easy in the beginning but now it's just automatic and when people say negative things to me or do negative things I said it's it's what it's not what they're doing to me it's what they're doing to themselves you know that's that's my attitude and and all that negative stuff for me is now it's just water off a duck's back mm -hmm. wow you know, with all the things that you've achieved, writing books, your um, whatever the the mission that you have uh, put yourself on the path to, what can we expect from you now in your third act? act? <laughs> yeah. Well, um, in a way, more of the same, but of a higher quality. Mm. Yeah, higher. And also, I think that it's when I was approaching sixty. I felt the kind of excitement like one would feel when one is turning 16. I was like, oh, I'm going to be 60, I'm going to be 60, you know. And, um, and it was, I, I really, I don't understand why I felt that way, but I think if I were to, if I'm to explain it, it's because, well, you know, every day is, the, is it can be a new beginning, right? That's, yeah. that's, that's one, you know. But I just feel that at this age, I've, I've, uh, learned so much I would never want to go back to being younger because so I can do the same things but on a higher level on a higher octave and I can do it with without all the the burden without all the mm, you know, <laughs> no, I, that, that, that it, I don't have that I, I, I can just sometimes I amaze myself I'm amazed also when somebody does something really bad to me and, and I'm just so calm.
calm you know, and blessing them and just and just kind of you know shrug my shoulders and, and I say that it's what you they're doing to themselves not what they're doing to me because it's like when somebody gives you a gift gives they you something take it or not. if you if you don't take it then then it's theirs you know so if I don't take an insult or something whatever negative it belongs it goes back to them so I just yeah. So, um, you know, just last question, Julia. Yeah. Any words of motivation for uh, fellow women in Indonesia? Well, I think it's a very challenging time um, n n now uh, in Indonesia because um, in the column that you referred to, which um, was actually published today, 16th, um, I... It was a very um, a convergence of the past, present, and future for me, and, and in a way I can describe that column that way because it's it's called women, um, life affirming agents, or uh, bombers who kill. Because when I and my fellow activist, um, female female activist went into the streets, in particular the one uh, in 1998, which is called uh, Suara Ibu Peduli, the Voice of Concerned Mothers. We positioned ourselves, we presented ourselves as mothers, even though we're feminists. But feminist is not a good word, uh, um, especially then. And so we presented ourselves as mothers who care, because mother, and, it, and we, uh, used milk as a sim as a symbol, and um, but as one of my friends said, it's not biological motherhood. It's mothers as in Indonesian, it's pemangku kehidupan or carriers of life. You know, which I think is just so so beautiful. That's what we are. We should see ourselves as carriers. Can you imagine? We have uh, uh, we have life on our laps you know you were saying on the on the shoulder of uh, giants yes yeah? um, and so that's that's what we're and now 20 years after we first presented ourselves we went onto the streets as mothers um, now motherhood has been taken on by female terrorists as a license to kill to kill others and even their own children. I just, it's totally unimaginable for me. It's just totally horrific. I was, I was crying for, I've been crying a lot these, these past uh, three days. And um, I think the, the challenge now, I think what I would like to say to my fellow in, Indonesians is, is don't look at our differences. We are Indonesians. First and foremost, we are Indonesians. And I hope that these challenges, these, these terrorist attacks will make us open our eyes to the fact that, that it's, well, basically, we need to be united against this common threat. It's not part of our culture, it's not part of our religion, it's not part of anything remotely in the Indonesians. You know, we are, uh, we are a tropical Islam country which is very different from the Middle East. We've always been tolerant. We've always, religion has always been assimilated into, into the culture. We've always been syncretic, you know, and why suddenly all of these um, uh, boxes and labels and you and us, you know, it's, why not all, why not, why don't we all be pamangku kehidupan? Why don't we all be carriers of life and embrace life and each other with all of our differences because that's really what makes us Indonesian and what makes us strong. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. That was really nice. Thank you.